So I've made this here 3D model, yeah? It's a pretty simple road model I used Blender to make it, and I want to pull it into my game, which I've written in C++ so I can use it as part of the environment. Like this. This is the finished product of this tutorial. The road model was loaded as in here. I'm able to move around and look at things. If you downloaded the demo, this is just WASD to move, and arrow keys left and right to rotate. Uh, notice there's no texturing, there's just solid colors. This tutorial specifically is about using the ASIMP library to load in geometry and material information from a file. Now, the website for ASIMP is asimp.sourceforge.net. Here you can download the source code, get the binaries, read the documentation, see what other features it has to offer. I did do a video before this one, just a quick and dirty, where I set up ASIMP with Visual Studio. I'm not going to be covering that here. Uh, ASIMP is cross-platform and graphics API agnostic, so Linux and Vulkan, it's cool. Because ASIMP doesn't care what environment you use, I'm going to be using DirectX 11 and Windows 10. Uh, that's just a personal preference kind of thing. The code that I'm covering in this video has minimal DirectX interaction, so if you're coming from an OpenGL background, you should still be able to follow along pretty well. Here's a quick diagram of the demo I'm doing today. Up here in blue is the engine code I reuse for most of the demos I've written, mostly math stuff. The orange-yellow code is Direct3D specific stuff. Most importantly, the material-only shader, which will encapsulate everything Direct3D needs to draw an object, colored by, you guessed it, a material-only. Uh, there's also a struct here called the render call, which will actually do the conversion between the logical vertices and indices and the Direct3D buffers. Everything has been written except for this ASIMP road model, which we'll be using the ASIMP library to load in the road model. This is what I'm going to be focusing on in this tutorial. Uh, the drawing material only app also serves as the basis of the application. It'll actually own the road model as well as the debug icosphere just for reference. So let's take a closer look at the model in Blender. If I turn on wireframe, you can see it's a pretty basic model, not a ton of polygons. I'm no 3D artist, so I just wanted to keep it basic. I have four materials defined, green, black, yellow, and gray. A material defines not just the color of a surface, but also how it reacts to light. Is it shiny, dull, is the color flat across the surface? Or is it much more prevalent in direct light? Uh, things like that. Okay, so here's the code I'm starting with. It's the same thing you saw in the beginning, just without the road itself. Uh, the camera and the icosphere are hooked up, though, so this tutorial will just be about putting the road into an existing project. And for my returning viewers, I decided to be a little more better about things and pre-recorded this so I can speed up less important bits. Let me know if you like the format. Function main is pretty easy. Make this debug material only app. The debug material only app itself derives from this demo app class. And the demo app will handle all of the initialization of Windows and Direct 3D. And then this initialize app is going to be overridden by all of the demo instances. For example, the drawing material only app. Every frame, this update and render will also be called exactly once in that order. Okay, so here's the debug icosphere that you saw spinning around. I've hard-coded in all of these vertices and indices. I actually used asymp to JSON to, oh, and normals. I have the normal information as well. That's which direction the vertices are facing. I used asymp to JSON to generate a file and then more or less copy and pasted the stuff I wanted out of it. Cool. Um, here I have an initialized method that constructs a vector of these material-only shader vertex objects. Each one needs a 3D position and a 3D normal. You can see there's a couple of floats in there for padding. That's just to keep the byte width right for the way Direct3D likes it. Um, so I construct this vector like so. I pretty much just add all those vertices and normals, and then I do the same thing with an indices vector using 32-bit unsigned ints pretty specifically. I'm going to be pushing into this render call object, and I do have to provide a D3D11 device. That's just because that's what's going to be used to actually allocate the graphics card side memory. Great, and then in the render, I have this shader here. I'm going to set a couple of uh, shader constants, the object material and model transform, and then actually call the render method with that call, which has the geometry information in it. Okay, uh, let's look a little bit more about the material-only shader specifically. Here's the vertex we talked about. Here's the material struct and directional light struct. You can see each one takes three color components. Uh, the details on what specular, diffuse, and ambient color are, look up the Fong lighting model. That's P-H-O-N-G. I'm probably pronouncing it wrong. Uh, the directional light also takes um, the same three color components in a direction. More or less, the specular component of the light is going to affect the specular component of the materials it affects and likewise for diffuse and ambient colors.
All right, and then down here we have a couple. Of these are for setting shader globals. Um, well, I won't really cover those that much. And then the render call itself. This is the interface between our logical code and the direct 3D code. Uh, you can see the vertices and indices go into a vertex buffer and index buffer. Um, that's going to be pretty similar between direct 3D and OpenGL, but again, I am using direct 3D specifically. I'm not going to cover really the rest of the file. I think that's a good enough coverage. Cool, so now that I've spent the last five minutes talking about stuff I've done off camera, let's actually get into writing this sucker. So I'll make an model.h, being careful to put it in with this demo and not with the common code. I'm going to be publishing all this, so there's a lot of code that the demos share. We'll fast forward all the includes and namespace. Um, I'm going to create a mesh object, and the mesh object is going to contain a render call as well as a material. Asymp splits up our imported geometry by material, and I've also written the shader that way. It uses a little bit less memory um, if you don't have to attach the material per vertex. So that's how I'm going to represent a model, comprised of multiple meshes, each with geometry and material. I'll also need a constructor, and that constructor will take in a list of meshes and a transform. The transform decides where this model lies in logical world space. Uh, I've written a transform class that I'll later be able to convert into a 4x4 matrix. Now there's a lot of things that can go wrong loading is something from a file, so I'm going to make a static method that returns a pointer instead of doing it in the constructor. That way I can return a null pointer if something goes south. I'll need the file name, a D3D device, and then the transform. And the D3D device is just for um, setting up the render call. Then I'll actually need a render method. It'll take in the device context as well as the shader that's going to be used to draw this object. I'm going to explicitly delete the copy constructor. I can't think of a good reason we'd want to be able to copy this road model. Um, it just sounds expensive and we don't need to. And then the destructor I can leave as the default destructor because we're not doing any manual memory management. I'll also need down here just the, the stuff that the class is consuming. Cool, with that written, let's go on to the C++ file. Um, you know what, I'm going to keep this as one window. I'll zoom it in up a little bit even, just in case you're trying to do the whole split screen thing and follow along. There, hopefully y'all can read that. Alright, these includes I'm going to go a little bit slower with. First one is C import. This contains the load from file method that we use to get an ascent object from the file. Second one is the scene.h. This contains the definition of the ascent scene object, which represents everything in a 3D model file that we're going to use. There's then postprocess.h, which contains a bunch of flags that ASIMP uses when loading a scene in its post-processing step, things like duplicate vertex elimination and triangularization of quads. And then material.h, which is going to contain helpers for working with ASIMP materials that we'll need uh, to use while extracting the material information from the scene. Okay, and the constructor is going to be the easiest to write. I'm just copying in the parameters passed in by the data members one to one. Uh, I did that very much on purpose. There's not really anything that can go wrong here. I'm copying a vector into another vector and a transform to another transform. So uh, that should be pretty easy. I won't even have to make a body for it, which is really the way a constructor should be. It's just as little work as possible, as little that can go wrong as possible, um, if, you, if you can finagle it. All right, so the load from file method, this is the meat and potatoes of the tutorial, and only nine minutes in. Great. Okay, so remember the transform given here is the same transform given to the constructor. We define that ourselves instead of loading it from a file. Even though ASIMP does contain that information in file, we're just not going to be using it. We want to be able to place our object in other places. All right, cool. So I'm going to make a const AI scene pointer, call it scene, and call the AI import file. Give it the file name, and then this process preset flag, which I'm going to use process preset, why not max quality? Process preset target real time max quality. Uh, if the scene is a null pointer, then I'm going to give an error. It could not load the file. Give the file name, output. Now, something interesting, we have this AI get error string that you can use. This will give you a human readable string about the last failed import process. So I'm going to use that in my debug message as well. Now the ASIMP documentation is actually really good. I recommend if you're trying to code something in ASIMP, especially if you're new to the library, you should definitely be keeping it open. Um, everything is, I've been very well impressed with the documentation. Okay, let's actually look a little bit more at the docs and we'll see in the AI import file, 
it reads the file, returns the com content, blah, blah, blah. I'm going to need this AI release import, which releases all the resources associated with the thing that was imported, the thing that was passed in. Uh, the data is stored internally to ASCINT. It handles all its own memory management. So we're going to have to tell ASCINT to release all the resources that it had gathered for that. That's also why this has to be a const AI scene pointer, um, because it's not our memory to deal with. So I'll just put that at the very end here. Okay, put in a little bit of commenting. All right, so I'm gonna make a vector of meshes because we're going to need that for our actual road model. Uh, I'm gonna do a reserve here, with scene mnum meshes. This is going to be the number of meshes in our ASIMP scene. And when I say scene, I pretty much mean the entire contents of the 3D file. In this case, specifically, it's going to be one object. And that object is going to contain four meshes, one for each um, material that we have defined. So we'll do a for loop to go through each one of those. Less than the meshes. There's an AI mesh pointer that I can make. And I'm going to grab the contents of scene and meshes at the mesh index in our for loop to grab that. Notice I'm calling a reserve. Um, the reason for this, this doesn't call the constructor on the, the new elements that I've created inside my internal array used by the vector. It just allocates the space for it so that when I do a pushback, it's not resizing the vector every time. Um, if I remember right, I could totally be wrong about this, but I think a vector, if it's not big enough, it doubles in size, the internal memory that's being used. Uh, and so if you're doing pushbacks, it ends up being um, an order log n kind of memory allocation scheme. But if you know how much you're going to use ahead of time, if you just call reserve right there, it becomes order one, which is much better. Uh, memory allocation is quite expensive. Not that it really matters here, initialization time. But I digress. Okay, so we'll do the same thing. We'll make a vertex array, or a vertex vector. I, I like the name array so much better. We'll reserve the space we're going to need, which is going to be stored in that mesh, the number of vertices that the mesh has. Notice it's not the scene anymore. Then I'm going to make an AI material pointer. I'm going to grab from the scene materials. Now, the mesh itself does not hold specific materials because meshes can share materials, say if you have like two different objects in your scene that you're trying to represent. So instead we have the scene and materials that's going to have a whole bunch of materials and each mesh is going to keep track of an index where it'll point back to which spot in the materials array is the material that that mesh uses. Great, I'm going to pull out, I'm going to make three color components in the ASIMF struct format for specular diffuse and ambient color. And then I'm also going to make this shininess float. And this is just, uh, this is part of how I've implemented the Fong lighting model here. I might have even done something a little bit wrong, but um, this is how I've seen it done and how I've typically done it is with those four components. Uh, the shininess will affect, I guess like it says, the shininess of an object. So how much specular lighting affects an object in the space. Anyways, uh, this AI get material color, this will take in a materials pointer as the first parameter. Second one is a flag specifying which color I want to grab from the material. And then the third one is going to be a pointer to the AI color 4D struct that we want to populate. So you can see I'm grabbing the specular diffuse and ambient colors, and then I'm going to grab a float. This is going to be the shininess component. So I'll just grab that right there. That is a single float. Awesome. Looks good. So now I have all the color in the ASIMP formats that I'm going to need. I'm going to do just a quick conversion to get it into my own material only shader material format. And this took also, if I remember right, it was a specular diffuse and ambient color in that order as the parameters. Yep, looks like I was right. I actually messed that up when preparing these tutorials, and so it took me a long time to debug, but it turns out I had diffuse and specular mixed up or something like that. Uh, and then for the alpha component of the specular color in my shader, that's actually where I'm putting like the power, the, the shininess of the material, the, the power, the specular power, if you will. Yep, right here, the W component, if you're HLSL familiar. Okay, so I will make a new color object and pass in the RGBA components like this, specular color.r, specular color.g, specular color.a, and then shininess 
for the oh, uh, specular color dot b. My bad. Uh, shining is for the alpha component, like I just talked about. Uh, diffuse color R G B A, and then ambient color R G B A. These ones do not have a weird alpha component. I don't actually think I use the alpha component for these ones, um, but 16 byte aligned usually tends to work out better for direct 3D things. Um, constant buffers have to be 16 byte aligned, so like I couldn't have just used uh, RGB values anyway, so I had to use RGBA or put in extra floats. Cool, so now with that out of the way, so that's the material. We're going to need a material on a render call, and the render call is going to need a list of vertices and indices, and each vertex is going to need a position and normal. So let's get those list of vertices right now. So I'll go through each vertex in the mesh, and that's just stored in an array, this mesh m vertices array. Uh, and then the number of elements in that array is mesh m num vertices. So I'm going to grab two components. The first one is going to be the vertex position, and the second one the vertex normal. And let me pull up the documentation here again. If I look at the m normals array, well, let's look at the m num vertices first. So this value, let's see, this is the size of all the per vertex data arrays. And so there's going to be a few data arrays that have per vertex data. M normals is one of them, so you can see right here the array is M num vertices in size. So that's how big that array is. And if we now look at the M vertices, now the actual M vertices array, where are you? There you are. Uh, this array is also M num vertices in size. This one's a little bit more obvious, but we, we do need both. Cool, so we can use that. I'll grab the vertex, position, and normal. And then for each one, I will push back to my vertices array. Again, I've pre-allocated the memory, so this pushback isn't going to be that expensive of an operation. Uh, the type is material only shader vertex, and it takes two parameters, the 3D vertex and 3D normal. Yep, uh, 3D vertex position and 3D normal. In fact, I'm going to rename that up here. I, I keep messing that up because I'm reading this myself, and I see vertex and normal, but it's position normal per vertex. X3, position.x, y, and z, and then same thing for normal.x, y, and z. So this will be our geometry data for the vertex. Great, so now I'm going to grab a list of all the indices. Now, ASIMP stores the indices differently than how they're normally expressed in um, like Direct3D or OpenGL applications. It's actually sort of a list of faces, and the face itself could be a triangle, polygon, line, um, any primitive. And the polygons are very commonly in 3D files actually quads, so they'll have four sides instead of three, but we want them to have three. However, we did specify a process preset target max time, target real time max quality, which contains a bunch of flags, including all the flags in the target real time quality. One of those flags is the AI process triangulate. And what this will do is any n-gons, where n is 4 or greater, it'll triangulate those. So uh, 3D models commonly contain quads. It'll split that into two triangles. And two triangles can be used by our application. So assuming we didn't have any points or lines in the file, which I'm pretty sure we didn't, everything will be triangles, which will be great. And I think there's actually even another flag that eliminates points and lines. So. Um, so we should just have triangles in here. Cool, so I'll make that vector of uh, standard UNT32. That is a 32-bit uns unsigned integer. We made a little typo there. I'll fix that. Um, and I'll make the number of faces times three, three indices per triangle. Um, I'll make the indices array that big. And then for each face, I'm just going to push back the mesh, the face at that face index. This is stored in the M faces array. Um, and the number of faces and m num faces kind of in accordance with the style we've seen earlier. And then m indices is going to have the actual indices. I'll just push in 0, 1, and 2. And I'll put in, in an assert up here too. This way, if for some reason it's not triangulated or there's a not three-sided, it'll fail very loudly. So the application will complain um, and crash, which is good from a debugging point of view. That way we can catch these problems earlier. Great, so now I have the vertices and indices as well as the device that was passed under this function. I'll make the render call right here. Boom, I have the call. And now that I have both the call and material, I can add that to my meshes array, and I'll do that like this. I'm going to use initialize of this format, um, just because I don't think I actually wrote a constructor for the mesh, so 
I, I happen to know that that's the order the data members are defined, so you can do it that way. Great, and then after that for loop is done, we'll have a list of all the meshes that we're gonna need, as well as the transform, which is passed in directly, so I'm gonna return standard make shared. This makes a shared pointer of type S and prod model, passing in the meshes and transform. And I'm gonna build that just to make sure it works. All right, skip to the build. Looks like it did build. So I'm going to write the render method now. I'm going to rush a little bit faster through this one just because it's not actually asymp related. This is more my engine. Um, so I'm going to set the shader. It looks like, okay, I missed a const there. My bad. So I'm going to set the shader model transform right at the beginning because that's going to be the same for all the meshes. They're all going to be placed in the same spot in the world. And then I'm going to go through and I'm going to set the material for this mesh in for loop. I'm going to set the material for the mesh and then I'm going to make a render call using the render call for that mesh. And that'll be it. That is the render. So return, get out of there. Awesome. Okay, so now back over here in the drawing material only app, I'll include the asymp road model. I'll make a shared pointer asymp road model road model member. I'll go in here, I'll initialize it to the null pointer. Then in my initialize app function, kind of where I have the debug icosphere, I'm going to create the road model. First, I do need a transform. Um, so I'll make that transform. And this is, um, the, the transform is just a helper thing that I made for the samples that I write. Uh, it logically contains information that's much easier to read and reason about, and then also methods to convert to and from um, a four by four matrix. So right now I'll just make, I'll say that it's positioned at the origin in the world, there's no extra rotation, and it's scaled by one, so nothing fancy. This is this will produce the identity matrix. Great, and then I will load from a file. Um, I'm not actually sure if I have the FBX file. I'm using an older version of Asymp, uh, 3.1. The reason for that is just that I can use the pre-compiled binaries. I have not been building from source from any of this. And it looks like I did change the directory structure. I've been doing a lot of git foo um, to get these things working right, or uh, to get the videos recorded right, I should say. So it looks like I need to move these back in here to the assets folder. Here's the Blender file. I'm just going to export to FBX. I'm using too new of a version of Blender, I think, for the older binaries of Asymp that I'm using. Uh, the, the code itself, by the way, will stay the same. It's still a 3.x version, so if you're using 3.3 or a newer version that's come out since this video has been made, as long as it's 3. Point something, the code should be uh, identical. Okay, I'll load the model from a file, road fbx, device, road transform. The device, again, is just for that render call. You can safely ignore it for this tutorial. And then if I got a null pointer back, I'll give an error message. All right, now I need to add to the render method. You can look a little bit about this. This also is direct 3D specific code, so if you're interested, it's cool, I guess. Uh, I'm setting all the shader globals that per frame can be set, like the position of the camera, the view matrix, the projection matrix. I'm rendering the debug sphere right there, so I'll just add a render to the road model as well. And I think that should really be it. We should be good to go here. So let's give it a run and make sure. Okay, it doesn't look like it. All right, if I move back a little bit, it looks like the road is imported. It's just not oriented correctly. The reason for this is because Blender has Z, the Z axis going up and down, while I have the Y axis going up and down. So I need to change that transformation. That sounds like something rotating 90 degrees about the X axis should fix. So a little styling right there. I'm still not sure. I, I'm trying out the style, doing the whole um, bracket notation with the parentheses. I'm going to see how I like it. So I'll change that quaternion to rotating about the x-axis 90 degrees. Great, so now it's at least horizontal, but it's definitely not facing the way I want. I want it to load into the world going forward back on the road. So instead of changing the camera and icosphere, I'll just rotate the road by 90 degrees about the y-axis now after it's been flattened out properly. And boom, here we are. Looks good. So this is what you saw at the beginning of the video. It maybe looks a little bit different. It looks like the specular lighting might be... Um, a little bit less pronounced, but hey, that's uh, that is the model. We pulled it from a file in the course of this. What is this now? 25 minute video. So I, I feel pretty good about that. Um, everything looks in order. Yep, all the geometry's been loaded. The materials look loaded well. Uh, again, the road isn't as shiny as it was in the beginning. I'll have to look to see what that was, but um, the specular light is at least still there. So cool.
Looks good. All right, uh, just some closing thoughts. Once again, I host the code on GitHub. I'm planning on making this repo public as soon as I release the video, but I still do have a few things to clean up to make sure it'll run on your computer as well as mine. Uh, there's also some library files and DLLs. I'm not sure how I'm going to handle that. I might end up just making a release version that contains all that uh, zipped up and everything. So I'm not sure. I'll put more about that in the description, maybe a text thing on the YouTube video. Yeah, because I still do have a little bit of work to do on this to make sure um, all the projects are set up using like local paths. Yeah, here I have some absolute paths. But anywho, I think that's it. So again, thanks for watching. Hope you learned something.